Okay, this is my last uh, Leverhulm uh, lecture. Mm -hmm. And um, it's coming to an end this period. Uh, uh, some of you have been here from the beginning. And um, what we have been doing, in fact, was to, has been to try to address from different perspectives what could be a research program that would be under the aegis of uh, the epistemology of the South, as I've been calling them. And trying from different approaches, and you saw our different topics. This is the, the tenth topic that we are addressing here. And for this last one, I chose decolonizing the social sciences. Well, the epistemology of the South, as, as you remember, has been this uh, series of inquiries that I've been proposing. Many other people have done so, but that's my own proposal. Of uh, production and validation of knowledge from the perspectives of those that have suffered in a systematic way the injustices produced by domination, exclusion, and discrimination caused by capitalism, colonialism, and sexism. So the idea is to see how we can, I run for you, how can we develop some uh, uh, knowledge from those uh, perspectives. And I've also said in previous lectures that uh, the epistemologies of the South, as I uh, formulate them, are there so that they won't be necessary in the near future. So there is uh, an inherent aspect of this uh, research program and epistemological program that it should wither away. Uh, because there are epistemologies of the South, because uh, only because there are Northern epistemologies of the North. They were not there, and uh, if they have not claimed the monopoly of rigor in our time and knowledge, there should be no need for these uh, epistemologies of the South. So the, it does make much sense to put the, the world just upside down. You know, it's the epistemologies of the South as if they were the solution for everything. The world is round, and, uh, and therefore is not flat, and uh, we think that uh, uh, the ideal would be that probably these epistemologies would, would wither away. And how would they wither away? Basically, they will, would wither away in a world which we could experiment, all of us in humanity and mankind, experiment as our own world, not theirs world but our own world. And therefore, that would be within reach, in our reach, to transform it. So this idea of being at home in the world is probably what we should be trying to get at. And the epistemologies of the South are necessary because most people in the world don't feel at home in the world that has been constructed by the social sciences and by the epistemologies that dominate the world, basically that. And that's why we call for the decolonizing of the social sciences. I also ask a, a question in the very first lecture here, probably in the debate at the end, or if we have time at the end, we'll discuss it. I ask whether it would be possible to write a PhD dissertation from the perspectives of the epistemologies of the South. And as you remember, I decided I'm not going to answer the question now. I'll answer it or try to answer it at the end of the lecture. So I remember that I'm committed to do that. But uh, we'll see how we'll go. Well, what does it mean to, in my way of thinking, uh, decolonizing the social sciences? What does that mean? Of course, it means it has a deconstructive and a reconstructive uh, uh, dimension. We can imagine that. Because it means basically that we should eradicate or submit to radical critique the knowledge that has justified the power differences based on hierarchies that exist in the world hierarchies that are justified because of the natural inferiority of some groups vis-a-vis -vis other groups. Natural here is the social construction of the naturality. People that are naturally inferior cannot be on the same par 
or with people that are naturally superior. So, to eradicate the power differences that derive from these hierarchies that are built upon the constructed natural inferiority of some groups vis-a-vis -vis other groups. So what are the consequences of this, uh, of this uh, natural inferiorities? Is that these uh, people cannot represent themselves other than through the knowledges that have been produced about them. And this knowledge has been produced within the social science as we know them. So the incapacity of representation is one of the, of the consequences of these power inequalities that are epistemologically justified by the epistemologists of the norm. And secondly, it means also that people cannot represent the world as their own. It's not just about themselves, it's about the world in which they live. They cannot represent them, that such a world as their own. So, these are the consequences, and if you look at this formulation, you can see that in the epistemology of the South, as we have been claiming, epistemology goes together with politics and goes together with ontology. What we are talking about is not just epistemologies, and in fact, is one of the traps of the Northern epistemologies, is to give total priority to epistemology and none to ontology, and of course separate very clearly politics from epistemology. This is uh, unacceptable from the perspective of the epistemologists of the South. So decolonize in this sense, and again some of the post-colonial thinking that abounds already, I'll be speaking in this lecture that we need to decolonize post-colonial stuff is that we should not accept this idea of center and peripheries in the idea that we are more creative at the margins. There are books like Marx at the <coughs> margins, uh, Mignola conceptions of post-colonialism or even Dussel and others. I don't think that uh, this margins metaphor is a good one for us. I would prefer alternative centers, multiple centers. There are other centers from which other kinds of knowledge can be produced and can be collectively made operative in the transformation of the world. What are the difficulties for such a conception? The first one is that decolonizing implies colonization, and colonization is a co-invention. That is to say, and this is a great African scholar, I should remember, that also claims this point. Colonization is co-invention. And therefore, this dichotomy colonizer, colonized has to be much more complex than what uh, we have uh, thought before. And probably we need also some decolonized, decolonizing of the colonizer, of the colonizer, of course, but of the colonized as both colonized and as an active participation participant in the colonization. Colonialism counted very much also on participation of the colonized. So it must be very difficult to try to understand and to render in epistemological, political, and ontological terms particularly, the idea of convention. Because there we are in a sense challenging a little bit, some, even of some of my ideas some of the formulations in the text that we have read beyond the Bissell thinking, uh, the idea, and it's also Fanon's idea, of the non-being. The, the other side of the line, as you have, uh, some of you have uh, ever read, is the other side of the line is the, the region of the non-being. This non-being is also complex in itself, and I think we have to address this difficulty. But there is a second difficulty is that decolonize the social science in the name of what and for what purposes? To create other sciences? To create other knowledge? To create, to do a counter-hegemonic use of social sciences? As I have been claiming for human rights, as I have been claiming for law, counter-hegemonic use of law. 
Should all the social theories that we know in the global world of scientific knowledge, which is North Centric as we know, should all of them be treated alike? <coughs> or are there differences? For instance, is Marxism less uh, objectionable from the point of view of the epistemology of the South than structural functionalism, or are they both part of the same package? Should we try to decolonize much of the studies on the anti-colonial struggles and the post-colonial studies? So these are questions that we should address, and uh, I'll address some of them. Well, for those that are familiar with my framework, you know uh, that the basic uh, uh, theoretical framework is the abyssal thinking. It's the idea of the abyssal line that creates a radical exclusion and a radical separation between those entities, practices, principles, ideas that exist on this side of the line and those that exist on the other side of the line. And in such a way that those that exist on the other side of the line vanish. They are non-existent. They are produced as non-existent. That's what I call the sociology of absences. And therefore, they are non-relevant in any way to address or to contribute to the universality or generality of our ideas. If we take the concept of rights, it is not that the other side is excluded from rights, is that rights <coughs> need right bearers or right holders. And there are no bearers on the other side, as conceived by the Northern epistemologists. And that's why the same entity, as we discussed in the previous le lecture, we can have a generous face idea of the same entity, and they don't speak to each other. Labor law is a very progressive form of protective law on this side of the line, and at exactly at the same time, forced labor. But no jurist, no lawyer that works on labor law in the North ever thought that at the same time that the protective labor law was being created, forced labor law, forced labor was also being created and instituted. So this incapacity, because on this side of the line we have regulation and emancipation, on the other side of the line we have appropriation and violence. Just a, a brief restatement of uh, my my theory there. So, decolonizing is a very strenuous, complex endeavor, and we have to go by stages, by layers, or by levels. And there are certain levels that belong to what I could call an internal critique of northern epistemologies, and uh, others that will go, uh, that will need an external critique. For the difference between external and internal critique, I um, recommend that you uh, read uh, uh, my introduction to the third volume of Verso, uh, a book called Another Knowledge is Possible. And there you can see the distinction between the internal and the external uh, critique of science and the knowledge. So let's go by degrees of decolonization, I would say, of defamiliarization, or using uh, a very good uh, playwright, uh, the degrees of separation. So let's start by degrees of separation from these conventional uh, social sciences. The first one, the first layer, is a, is a, is a, complica a complicated layer uh, but much has been done uh, in this in this area is uh, the critique of the universal history or of the world history as Hegel would uh, put it. Hegel's conceptions of the uh, philosophy of history has been very influential uh, throughout the, the global north and uh, as you know uh, this uh, philosophy of law is very well known uh, and if it is, and is well known because most people haven't read Hegel, but they don't need to read Hegel because uh, they're hegemonic. You know, even if you read The Guardian, you see Hegel there. <laughs> you don't have to read Hegel. It's the conception of linear time. It's the idea that Africa is no historical part of the world, as Hegel says very clearly. 
India and China are pre history And you have the Greek moment, you have the Roman moment, you have the medieval moment, the Christian moment, you have, and you have finally the Prussian model of, uh, of history. This, of course, is the, an absolutely Eurocentric analysis of world history. We know that. The critique has been done. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. We have in India the subaltern studies, but it's an internal critique in a sense. It is within the same framework of the historical sciences that you can criticize these questions, these conceptions of history. Probably the most interesting outside uh, or, or beyond the, 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 the subaltern studies is the Dakar uh, School of Historiography, which started with Sheikh Antatyub in 1955 with Lucky Turnev in which a guy that is a PhD from La Sorbonne, is an historian, tries to revise completely the history of Africa and put it upside down. And in a sense, creating what today the historians call a new essentialism, the essentialism of pre-colonial Africa, the grandness of pre-colonial Africa. But it is, in any case, a, a very stark critique of, of the Hegel formulation of philosophy of history. There are many others, one, some of them you are more familiar with, Jack Goody and many others, and Joseph Needham, a, a work that probably never, many people read very clear because there are so many volumes and so complex, is China, uh, uh, Science and Civilization in China. In which, in a sense, what these authors are doing is what I think we have to do with the uh, traditions of the, of the social sciences to demonumentalize them. So Joseph Kidnidham, what he does is to demonumentalize the Western uniqueness of scientific discoveries by showing that they have been there for a long time, sometimes for many centuries in China. And this work is today pursued in the schools of thought of history of science in Malaysia, in Singapore, uh, in which uh, new work is being done, uh, particularly going back to the Sanskrit texts, in which, after all, probably much of this work started and then taken by the Arabs and, uh, and then by the Christians, so to say. So I think that this, uh, this uh, first uh, level of uh, defamiliarization has also to do with a critique of some of the post-colonial studies, the history of colonialism and post-colonial studies. I think one of the, the tasks that we have to undertake here is that I don't think it is enough to provincialize Europe, as Chakrabarti said. I think we need to provincialize the new world. Many of the theoreticians of post-colonial studies have put all their emphasis on the new world, on the Americas, as the founding element of Western modernity. Because it is through the discoveries that, in fact, Western modernity is developed. It's characteristically the case of Dusa or Mignon. Well, this approach universalizes something that cannot be universalized. Because there were other discoveries which were very different there were other oceans that were very different from the Atlantic Ocean. The process of discovery and globalization in the Atlantic Ocean has nothing to do with the Indian Ocean, where the Europeans, when arrived there, they confronted, were confronted with a very rich, vivid, and intense forms of commerce and globalization conducted by those that, in fact, were the ones that led Vasco da Gama to India, the pilot from Mombasa. Mombasa. So it's a different world. And the colonization in India, in the East, in Africa, was very different from the one in Latin America. And therefore, different colonialisms lead to different post-colonialisms, probably. And I think that we have to see the global project of colonialism and capitalism with all this diversity and try to bring it into the picture, at least to acknowledge the diversity of this project very intense 
diversity, and therefore uh, be a little bit aware uh, that of these consequences, because the consequences of, in a sense, giving all the priority to the new world as the founding element of Western modernity had an, intend, an unintended consequence. It was to homogenize Europe. If you read these authors, Western modernity is a monolithic thing. It's a monolithic entity. But of course, it is not a monolithic entity. And in fact, it's a very internally diversified entity. If it were so monolithic, we would not, not understand the crisis in Southern Europe now, for instance. It is not sad. It has been a very and much more different type of, of history. And within Western modernity, there have been many modernities. Uh, we have distinguished between the first and the second. And uh, there has been a Central Europe and uh, the, the Nordic peripheries and uh, the Southwest peripheries and the Southeast peripheries and the Eastern peripheries. All of them, in a sense, would be Europe, but they were not involved in the same way in this uh, colonial project. Even though it is not, not necessary to, to have been involved in colonialism to have a colonial state of mind. Germany, for instance, played a very minor role in colonialism. But nobody believes that colonialism as a mindset is more absent in, in Germany than it is in France or in, or in Portugal or Spain. So I think that this idea of uh, decolonizing these historical views is very important. Because, as I say, it is enough to read The Guardian to see how this, the idea, this, this Hegelian idea of the historical events. It's a key concept, if you read the, the philosophy of history of, of Hegel, is the idea of historical events, the ones that change history. And the most important one uh, to which he dedicated a lot of attention was Napoleon invasion of Egypt. Because it was bringing about, in fact, the bureaucratic state, the modern bureaucratic state. And therefore, the freedom of the spirit. Because the period, as you see in Hegel, history is the growing uh, path of, uh, of uh, the progressive path of human freedom to its own liberation, to its own being, which in the end is the state, the modern state, as the configuration of uh, the human freedom as we understand it. So I think that so much for that we could go on and analyzing the, all the different differences between these macro histories and the micro histories and uh, you know the contingency. Uh, that's what we usually see in history, and not so much of this uh, 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 critiques. And the critique of these uh, of these worldviews, of these uh, dominant conceptions of history, is also itself very, very, very different. It is different in different continents. Again, in Africa, it's very important that it has been particularly difficult in Africa to conquer self-representation an enabling representation of the continent. And this has been uh, a very, I was two weeks ago in Dakar for uh, one week of conference, which was supposed to be in Bamako, but because of Mali's event, was events was uh, conducted, or was held in Dakar. And we were discussing precisely still this problem of how representing how to represent Africa in an enabling way, and if Africa as such is representable. Because this idea of the homogenizing concept of Africa as, as of any other continent, again, comes from Hegel. Because if it is, as he says, in Africa, the spirit sleeps. And therefore, is uh, coincident with this undifferentiated mass of this continent, undifferentiated mass. So this has been played out in very different ways by in Africa. And uh, as uh, Mbemba says, it's very interesting that if in fact it is so difficult for people in many continents to represent themselves, then history is a kind of sorcery. Because it's not something that is under your control. 
is witchcraft. There are mysteries, mystery, mysterious powers that, in fact, conduct your societies that are beyond your control. It's very important to see that. Within this first degree, social sciences, their content. And here we have a lot of demonumentalizing to do. First of all, we're the founders, Max Weber, Durkheim, and uh, Marx. Because all of them, in one way or the other, they play the uniqueness of the West in different ways. If you go these days to Morocco, to the sociology department in Rabat, and if you attend the lectures of sociology 101, you'll see that the founders are not these ones. The great founder of social science is even Calvin, who lived in the 14th century. And if you read Ibn Khaldun, you really see that there has been a very false history of social science to see that the founders of this social science are just these three guys from, from Europe, from, you know, basically from the same epoch here in, in, the, in the West. Because you can see many of the, there's a, a colleague of ours in Rabat just wrote a very interesting piece on <coughs> on the conceptions of social cohesion in Durkheim and Ibn Khaldun in Mokadima, his major work. There are very striking similarities. And there is even talk that probably he, Durkheim was influenced by him. But what I think it's very important is to know that there have been many other people outside the West. Uh, Ibn Khaldun was born in, in, in Tunis and died in Cairo in which they have been producing very excellent kind of work, which has been completely out of the canon of our social sciences. And this is what I've been calling the waste of experience, because we have been wasting all this experience of knowledge. And it's so insidious, this, that even Haldon is going to be discovered after the disciplines have been created. I'm not going to enter into all the logic of the disciplines. The disciplines of, as gated communities, as you know. Gated epistemic communities that have this double characteristic of expelling out of their borders both the non-specialists and all the specialists that don't, or knowledge that don't fit their models. But because it was discovered after the disciplines, there is a lot of problem when you analyze what people in the North say about even Caldon. Because they say, well, he was an historian. Yes, but he was also a sociologist. And he was an economist. And he was a jurist. And he was a geographer. There is no other way of naming him than through the discipline, because it doesn't fit them. Notice now, if you see the same when we talk about Aristotle. Does anyone talk about Aristotle in these times? No. Aristotle was discovered much before the disciplines. That's why he's a philosopher. But of course he was an economist. He wrote a book on economics. He was a political scientist. He wrote politics. He was a lawyer. He wrote constitutions. But we don't say that Aristotle was a philosopher, a political economy, uh, an economist, a sociologist, an anthropologist, a lawyer. So disciplines, discipline our way of looking at the world. So if you look at these different social sciences, of course we know that, uh, you know, uh, in this respect, it's very important to see the disciplines. Is, uh, many people have been discussing these. I'm, not, I'm just laying out a research problem. I'm not doing it, of course, in one lecture. It would be impossible. But the, the, you know, the distinction between the as science, sociology, and the them, science, the anthropology, it's very clear. And Mudimba, in his uh, seminal work on the idea of Africa, shows what he says in a very striking way, the colonial library. The colonial library was done by the, the books, by the missionaries, by the travelers, colonial administrators, and from the 19th century onwards by ethnographers and social scientists. So they, in fact, are the ones that prevent, that create 
a form of representation that prevents the subjects of their representations to represent themselves otherwise. So I think that this criticism has been conducted and the, the demonumentalizing is, uh, is taking place and, and should take place because how can we imagine that an Islamic uh, intellectual scholar is very well distinguished with, between science and religion. He's talking about the philosophical sciences and the, the religious sciences, which is theology. He's uh, talking about social change. And so there are two kinds of social changes, the radical and the progressive, that distinguish between rural and urban societies. Well, many things that we thought were developed only in the 19th century Europe. So I think that this is, we should pay attention to, to this. But then we have to understand that's a different layer of, uh, of, it's the same layer still within the social sciences. And again, demonumentalizing the West, not just the authors, but the practices. We keep believing that the Industrial Revolution is a unique social event in history. It's an historical event. Of course, it's a very important event. But as I mentioned to you in a previous lecture, does not explain why in 1750, half of the international trade was controlled by China. Why, for centuries, this very important event was not considered a world historical event? And this uh, is, of course, becoming very ridiculous when we, particularly in the United States, and probably here too, have to teach to so many Chinese students about the uniqueness of the Industrial Revolution, as if nothing else had existed before. <laughs> And we do the same with the university, of course. And um, we know also that the first university was not Bologna or Coimbra, my own, but was uh, Al Azhar in Cairo and Timbuktu. And in fact, we just saw recently this marvelous protection of the documents that exist in Timbuktu when they were attacked by the Islamists recently. You know, and all the families that keep these documents since the 13th century managed to hide most of them. In fact, they were not destroyed. Most of them were not destroyed because they were put in a safe place in the desert, as they have done endless times since the 13th century. And uh, this is Timbuktu, and was uh, a center of learning for many centuries, for many more people than Bologna, which was very important from 1290 on, and had a lot of students. Uh, so, you know, started with 2,000 students in Bologna, as, in fact, as a private university. So I think that this uh, colonial library has to be undone if you want to move along. The second level of defamiliarization is to defamiliarize ourselves with the dominant knowledge on Europe itself, as I said. It's not just that there have always been different Europes inside Europe. That what we call European values is something Hobsbawm made that point very clear. It's, it's something that comes from the, after the Second World War. And in fact, this continent had all these peripheries and the, the idea of core values, European core values, are one of the most problematic concepts that we can imagine, even though it has been so self-evident in the last 50 years. But the most important thing, I think, is that there are other Europe's today. That is to say, the Ibiza line runs in our cities. The Ibiza line of creating non-being radical exclusion is it in London, is it in Lisbon, is it in Paris? And uh, these are the other Europe, Europe's that don't belong to the canonic dominant view of Europe. And they have to fight not against inclusion, just, they not fight just for inclusion. They fight the criteria of inclusion. 
which is another liberal trap that we have, and in this country has been very prevalent, the trap of multiculturalism. Once you accept multiculturalism, they are integrated. They are included. What kind of inclusion is that? The blacks, the Afro-Americans were included after the civil rights movement. But what kind of inclusion is that? In which most of the black youths in the United States today are incarcerated. It's a, a very American way of solving unemployment rates. So this, uh, if you look at the movements that are today, and, and this is very striking, what I'm telling you is, is really very difficult for us to, you know, to address. One of the parties in Paris, in France, is the anti de la République. I don't know if you know that. They are second generation French youth from the Maghreb, and they have been uh, fighting against uh, European racism. But his leader, in fact, is a, a woman, Uriah, very good friend of mine, is coming now to Coimbra very soon for uh, an event. This woman is asking for refuge in other countries because it's being threatened, her life has been threatened, because they say that she is an Islamic racist against Europeans. And uh, because it's, she's very radical in denouncing European racism. And her life is in danger. And we know that in France they have killed some of these leaders. So it's not surprising that something would happen to her. And uh, the week before now, this last weekend, uh, we were, I was in, in Athens for a meeting of the Indignados and uh, different movements from the Southern Europe. And it was really surprising to me that in the room there was just one black guy, one Afro-European guy. In fact, came with a Portuguese delegation from Cape Verde, immigrant, representative of the immigrants. That is to say, even the indignados, as uh, we have discussed in a previous lecture, the indignado struggles, they tend also to be racist vis-a-vis -vis immigrants in Europe, in Spain, in Portugal, in Greece. And in fact, that's one of the the tricks that neoliberalism is playing in Europe is turning the poor against the poor, as they have done before. Capitalism has always done that. So if you bump into a taxi, a taxi driver in, in Athens, of course the Greek problems are basically due to the Romanians, to the Bulgarians, to all these immigrants that are taking our jobs. That's the usual uh, narrative. So here we need to analyze the diversity of Europe to <coughs> deassemble what this is, as we have to do with Africa. There's no need, no reason why it should be different for Europe, and therefore criticize not just exclusion, but inclusion. Because if inclusion is not itself intercultural, it is a way of excluding. A third level of defamiliarization is a bit more complex, and this is at the borderline between internal and external critique, it is uh, the critique of the concepts that have created the world vision that turns the European project, or the Western-centric project, or the Global North project as the universal project. So there are really clusters and clusters of concepts that are taken for granted in our social sciences, in our legal systems. And their purpose is precisely to develop this cosmovision that justifies, legitimates the worldview as uh, being the worldview that favors all the civilizational advances of the West or of Europe. What is the, the meaning of this? 
is that again, very clearly, these concepts are created in such a way that most of the people in the world cannot experiment the world as their own. That's basically what this is there. Take the ideal types of Weber. Many of you, I don't know, we are at law school, but you know, sociology this is a very common procedure of the ideal types. If you look at the ideal types of family, of society, of law, of state, of anything, without exception, the European societies are much closer to the ideal type than any other society. All the other societies are very far away of the ideal type. It is true that the ideal type, because it's an ideal type, is an ide ideal construction, so nothing in reality matches that exactly. But the, the European entities are the ones that approximate most the ideal type. And that's why, of course, the rest of the world is always in, in the wrong side of history, so to say. So it's very important. Uh, I'm not going into the details on the critique of the abstract universalism. We have discussed that in a previous lecture. And I drew your attention to why this oxymoron, this oxymoron has, has lasted for so long unquestioned. The idea from the Frankfurt School of the European Universalism. Because if it is universalism, it's not European. If it is European, it's not universal. But this is the key concept that still holds and is still very important to demonstrate one thing that is still, as I say, you don't have to go through the others, go to the newspapers or the TV, is that there is no way of going ahead outside the European project. So there is no outside to this European project. So the critique has been done by several. I'm not going into that uh, in detail. Another concept which I think we have to address is the concept of normality. Social order and above that, normality. Because normality is a very complex philosophical, sociological and legal concept. Because the normal is the opposite of the abnormal, of the exceptional, of the critical and of the anomic. So it's very polysemic. But this concept of normality, which is absolutely crucial for the structure of functionalism, in all these polysemics, tends to develop theories that favor, without exception, whatever is going on in our societies in the global West, in Europe and North America, basically. And that's why my students today in Portugal or in the US, when they come from Latin America, here they come from Africa or from other parts of the world, they question us, why are you concerned about this crisis as something new? We have always lived in crisis. For many people in the global south, crisis have been, has been the normal way of being. Therefore, the concepts of what is normal in crisis, what is critical, or is in crisis, is something that we have to, to address. There are many countries, many people in the world, most people in the world, that live in permanent crisis. What is a crisis in this sense for this normality? Normality in sociology is almost the same as the concept of society. Normality is a set of stabilizing expectations. If I work every day, I expect to get my salary at the, year, at the end of the month. If I'm at the bus stop and uh, the bus is coming at a given hour, I have a stabilized expectation that the bus will come. If there is 7 p.m. or 8 p.m., there is a stabilized expectation that I'll have my dinner, depending on the countries. Well, in Spain, it's 9.30. Well, there are many people for whom these expectations are not there. There are no buses coming on time, no salaries coming on time, and no meals coming on time. 
So these very general concepts are also to be critically analyzed. And one of them, since we are at law school, is the concept of rights and justice. It is a very interesting thing that we tend, particularly in the concept of, I was discussing with some of you at the research seminar before, the day before, on, on, on Wednesday, why the concept of subjective right, which the historians have, or already legal historians have uh, convincingly said that is a late medieval concept, doesn't exist before. In fact, it's very interesting. It arises as from the Franciscan, the concept of subjective right, to have a right to something. Because the Franciscan, the, the, the Franciscan order was supposed to have no right to anything because God, uh, Jesus, had been the poorest person in the world with no right, no property. And therefore, they, and it is by negation, they criticize the idea of subjective right as we know it today. But in our concepts, right there, rights have always been there. So we evacuate history, and in those so doing, it is much easier for us to be unreflective and uncritical about these concepts. Of course, I'm not saying that what the philosophers call the genetic fallacy is not a fallacy. That is to say, the historical origin of a concept does not neutralize the truth content of a concept. For example, human rights may be Western in origin. But now they are universal. So that, this is basically what uh, we call for genetic fallacy. That is to say, the fact that they were born in the West doesn't mean that they are only valid in the West. They are universal. You know, those that have read my work, that I don't believe that. I think they are really Western. And that's why I've been uh, uh, pleading for intercultural conceptions of human rights or other forms of human dignity that you, can, that you can imagine. But this idea of rights, or the idea of, of justice in Rome, there are even critiques within liberal philosophy that address that. Why justice is so preeminent in the theory of liberalism in John Rawls? Why not other values or other virtues? These are things that we have to address. And you can do that from an internal point of view and an external point of view. There are different critiques which in previous work I have, uh, I have designated as paradigmatic critiques and sub-paradigmatic critiques. We can, if you want, we can uh, do that uh, in detail. And now I move to the theories. Also, in, within this third level of defamiliarization, there are also theories and concepts. I think that we have to do two things here, and it will take a long process to do it, even though it is being done already is to engage in a critique of conventional concepts, very often not to eliminate them, but to, to, to unmask, to unveil, as Heidegger would say, their being, their limits, their boundaries, their origins, bring in history so that you can bring criticism and transformative energy against these concepts. If you take Tony's conception between society and community, it's a very simple one. You look at this distinction, you see immediately that most of the world is in the wrong side of history. Because only Europe is on the side of society. Most of the other societies are in the Gemeinschaft group. Gemeinschaft, the, the German word for community. And you do that with the concept of the family. And you can do that with the concept of health, with the concept of law, with the concept of property, with the concept of risk. So these are key concepts that have to, to be critically engaged with. And I think we can do that. It is being done. As I say, I'm, I'm just putting forward a research program that is being conducted by many. And in some areas, uh, we have here Padre Sosa in the field of law is also conducted there. But the problem is there are concepts that we have to invent 
or concepts that we have to give more prominence than they have now. If we take seriously these epistemologies of the South, there are other concepts that are not there, or they are not there in the place they should be. That is to say, the central cores of our theories, of our theoretical undertaking. The, the concept of suffering, the concept of memory, the concept of war. Our social sciences are based on the idea of peace, peaceful society. We even created some special fields for discussing the war, which in fact, Many of those are called peace research, even though they deal with wars, basically. But war is the common experience of many people, most people in the world today. Different kinds of war. Racialized bodies and races is also a key concept. Reparation violence. So these are concepts that don't, I'm not saying that they are not there, they are there. But they don't have the prominence they should have. The concept of sacrifice as well. And of course I'm not going to deal with the concept of development, we did that in a previous lecture, or the concept of progress, we did that too. And in a sense also the concept of the tradition. And here is very important, in which we have to decolonize the post-colonial studies is that in many of the post-colonial studies there is sometimes a romanticiz romanticization of tradition. And tradition sometimes is also very reactionary. And what is tradition? Is an alternative modernity? This is a, a concept, an idea that goes today as a very strong in social studies. The idea that there are many other modernities other than the European modernity. And how many people outside, in Java, in uh, Indonesia, how they have studied from the 18th century onwards, very modern type of values and of ways of being that were not European. But there are other modernities. So this is uh, another way of dealing with alternative centers, not margins alternative or other centers. So this is another topic which I think is important. The fourth level of the familiarization, and I, I don't have much time, well it's already late, uh, I should have finished in a minute, but uh, I just mentioned that, is uh, the main dichotomies, or at least three of the main dichotomies that I've been Engaged with, and, I, and we dis dedicated some of our lectures to this, so I'm not going to, to expand much. But of course, the first one is the individual community one, because it is a founding dichotomy of the Western epistemologies and theories, and is a very unique and exceptional. And in many cultures, they don't even have this idea of being, as the individual being, as we have discussed. And I was recently came across with a a very important Argentinian thinker, absolutely forgotten, that developed the concept of uh, a very interesting concept based on indigenous uh, cosmovisions against the concept of being in the Heidegger, star sendo in Spanish and Portuguese. I am a being. I am not. I am a being. Which in Portuguese and Spanish allows us to give two movements, the space and the idea of being. Star is to be there. Star is to occupy a place. Star send means being. That is to say, to being in a specific place and therefore time space in the same concept. And of course, if you have this concept of being, the dichotomy individual community is not there. So I Address that in a previous lecture, we discussed the Frankfurt School conception of the autonomy of the individual as being very problematic, uh, and uh, I'm not going into that. The second one is between nature and society. It's also, we also did that when we discussed the rights, uh, the rights of nature and the indigenous constitutions of Ecuador and Bolivia. 
And the third one is the immanent transcendence, transcendent, immanent transcendent dichotomy, uh, which we have uh, usually identified with conceptions of secularism in the West. Um, believe it or not, these dichotomies are very, very important. Now that we are heading for the, the World Social Forum in Tunis, which will be at the end of March, these are, I'm sure, most of these dichotomies are going to be very much present there. They are already, they are already burning the field, uh, particularly the last one, on the conceptions of, of uh, imminent and transcendent. The final layer of defamiliarization is external critique because it's about the ways of knowing. Whether as I have explained to you in a, discussed with you in a previous lecture that the epistemologies of the South are born, knowledge is born in struggle. And at the universities, usually teach the university is the knowledge of the winners as told by the winners. What is this? What are these kinds of knowledge? These times, the concepts of time and space that underlie these other kinds of knowledge, what we could call the ecology of knowledge. That was the key concept. The distinction between subject and object. The distinction between objectivity and neutrality. These were key concepts that we discussed in previous in previous uh, sessions, but once we try to decolonize the social science by bringing in different ways of knowing, which are not separated as knowing practices, because what is specific of scientific knowledge is that is a kind of knowledge separated from other practices. Most of the other knowledges are not separated from other practices. They are the practices of knowing and are knowing as practices of doing something else, of cultivating the fields, of making friends, or making enemies, or whatever. So I think that we have a question of methodology here. How we develop methods, that's, uh, if you go to the page of my project, the Alice project that we mentioned before, that's our concern now, how to develop new participatory methodologies. Is it possible to go beyond the participatory action research, which is one of the participatory methodologies that we have been discussing? Method is very crucial, but it's also very crucial other things that I just mentioned because we don't have time to go into that. The questions of language. And I was explaining to the other students, I'm, I'm sorry if I have to repeat this here, that, in fact, I've always been in favor of the counter hegemonic use of uh, different things like human rights and the language. I was explaining to them, uh, because I had this experience in, uh, in, in Greece, in Athens, that in 2004 we were preparing the European Social Forum and we could not really talk to each other. It was very difficult to run the meeting, not because of the political difficulties among people, but because they didn't speak the same language. And even people that knew English, refused to speak English because it was imperialistic. And they wanted to speak in Italian or Spanish. Now we were meeting in Athens and everybody was speaking English. And there was no question of imperialism there. And uh, I said, well, we have not, not noticed this, but it's very enabling. I mean, we have a common language, a vehicular language. I mean, we speak other languages. But now we can unite. We, you, you can't imagine 10 years ago the question for uh, translators, that to translate the issues one for the other. Now we can talk, we can discuss, we can organize struggles throughout Europe in this colonial language. But we know this is one aspect. The other aspect is the unpronounceable things in other languages, things that are not pronounced in colonial languages. We also discussed that when we analyzed the concept of summa causa in the, in the indigenous constitutions of Ecuador or Suma Kamani in Bolivia. So I'm not going into that. There are concepts that we cannot pronounce in colonial languages. They are not real equivalents. What we can do is intercultural translation. Hence, the key concept that is, as you know, that I've been developing. And there is the question of the oral and the writing. And I think that we have to go back to an engagement with the oral ways of communicating knowledge in our societies. 
primary orality, secondary orality, different concepts, uh, but we have to do that. And, and there are very good resources to do that. So I conclude, because it's really getting late, and uh, as I was telling you, the decolonizing this enterprise to try to see whether we can develop strategies in such a way that we can experiment, experiment the world as our own, and therefore it is under our reach to transform it. That is to say, we have to try to reduce as much as we can the reality of people that are in the world as exiles, as intruders, as foreigners, as immigrants, as squatters. And there are people that are none of the above, but are at the mercy of others. They are non-foreigners, they are not immigrants, they are not intruders, they are citizens. But citizens without rights. And you can see that in Europe these days very clearly. They are at the mercy of others. So they are in exile in a sense. They cannot experiment the world as their own if they are dependent on the philanthropy of an NGO to be fed tomorrow. And more citizens in Europe are going through that experience. So if it is, in fact, uh, this possibility, then the possibility of transformation is probably the possibility of a commonality on the basis of this immense diversity of the experience of the world. But you cannot do that if we don't have a sense of sharing. And to have a sense of sharing, we have a sense of knowledge that being very different, they allow for some level of intercultural translation. Well, you know that all this sounds very utopian, but uh, you know that's the last sentence I put in the Toward the New Common Sense, my 95 book, uh, citing from Sartre. All the ideas are utopian before they come to reality. So this one is maybe one of those. So thank you very much, and we move now to the debate.